We last left off with me beginning my training to get even faster than Rush Hour. After my humiliating defeat, I can't let him one up me like that again. I didn't expect my own reverse flash to show up, and while this guy doesn't seem pure evil like him, he's still a dangerous threat. And if I let him get even faster, then I know that we stand no chance. A speedster is a very dangerous villain to have, since even if all the Avengers joined together to fight him, he would definitely kill them all. He said he got his powers after studying how I had them in the future, so I need to try and find a way to develop these powers on my own. The problem is, that's easier said than done. I can't just will myself to get these abilities on my own, and there really isn't anybody else to train with me since I'm the only speedster around, and nobody can keep up with me. Fitzsimmons try their hardest to come up with tests that I can use and try and get faster, but they're all too slow for me, and I breeze through it like it's nothing. What am I supposed to do? I've been training for a while now, and in this time, Iron Man 3 has already happened, since I've just been so busy with my strut of rush hour. Karis went up to help Happy not get blown up though, as she was able to get her new costume from Fitzsimmons that didn't look like a Loki cosplay. With her new suit, she has renamed herself Violet Knight. And as Violet Knight, she helped contain the extremist explosion, that way a lot of innocent people survived, and Happy wasn't in critical condition. She held off cold blood for a while by shooting her magic at him to keep him at bay, until the cop showed up and he escaped. Violet Knight is heralded as a new hero in town, and they're all not scared of her anymore since she isn't dressed exactly like Loki. I've been trying to determine how to finally get stronger since who knows what Rush Hour is doing right now, and it really doesn't seem to be helping. I need somebody else. Suddenly, it hits me. I did forget about somebody who could help me. It's a long shot since I don't know if they're allowed to interfere, and it may anger a couple people, but it's the only shot I have to protect us. I begin to study sign language, and since my brain works a lot faster than everybody else's, I can learn it and master it in no time flat. I go to Fitzsimmons and ask them if they're done with my new suit, and luckily, they've had it done for quite a while now. I try on the suit, and it fits perfectly. I am now Speed Demon once more. I burst out from the scene and rush towards my destination. I make my way to Iraq and use my energy signal device I snatched from Fitzsimmons to try and find who it is I'm looking for. After running around for a while, I find a large energy signature. This must be the place. I can't really dig it up myself, but I gotta at least try. I begin to run around, hoping to kick up enough sand to unbury the ship. I'm kicking up a lot of sand, but before I'm even able to see the ship, I get blown back by a huge shockwave. I fumble a ways away and quickly stand up, seeing the eternal Makari looking at me in confusion. I sign that I mean no harm, that I wanted to track her down since I need her help. She looks very shocked that I know how to communicate with her, and she signs back, how do I know who she is? I sign that I'm technically an extraterrestrial being like she is, and I have a lot of knowledge of the events of this world, and know all about her and the other Eternals. I understand that she isn't allowed to interfere in the lives of us mortals, but there is somebody with abilities like her and me out there. Bakari stops me, saying she watched it all in the news of my battle with Rush Hour, and says she's surprised that there are people with similar abilities to her. I sign that this guy is bad news, and I'm not asking for her help in going to stop him, since I doubt she's allowed to do that, but if she could train me up into getting as fast as her, then she can help me do it myself. Makari laughs, as she's never taught anybody else before, mainly since there's been nobody around to teach. The teaching is normally from Ajax, but technically it's not really interfering in any big battles, since if Fastos is allowed to make machines for humanity, she can give them her own weapon as well. She knows I'm not a bad guy as she saw me help against the Abomination and the Chitauri invasion, so she'd be happy to help. I thank her very much, and she signs that she's actually pretty excited, since she's never met anybody like her before. Maybe the two of us should race so we can determine how much training I actually need. I agree, and the two of us get ready to race. We agree to go on a race to Japan, and burst off. At first, it seems like we're both dead even, and Makari looks at me and smiles. We can't really sign while we're running, but I can tell she's happy to finally have somebody else really like her. Then she winks at me and speeds off. I look in shock as I didn't expect her to be that fast. I amp myself up and try to catch up with her, but it's no use. She's so fast that I was left literally in her dust. By the time I make it to Japan, I find her sitting there sitting on a chair reading. I laugh and tell her that she's amazing. I knew the Eternals were great, but this is in a whole different league. She tells me that I wasn't bad at all, and if I stay with her, then I'll certainly get even better. She asks for a race back, and of course, I comply, with her slowing down for me and running side by side, the whole way. That way she can see how exactly I run, so she can analyze the way I do it. 
Once we get back to the Domo, she asks how I got my powers, and I sign that it was when I got hit by Odin's lightning, and infused with Bruce Banner's gamma radiation blood. She is impressed with that, as she was just born with her speed, and has always had it to her knowledge. I don't want to reveal to her that she is an android yet, since that might mess up the whole flow of stopping Tiamat from bursting onto the planet, and I don't want to be a cause of the planet's destruction like that. With that though, Makari and I begin training together, with her attempting to get me to move the way she does, and have my body flow all together naturally as one, to help me accelerate myself much faster than I already do. She teaches me to move my body in tandem, that way I can just allow myself to take off. Luckily, my powers made my body super durable, as she could tell when she blew me away with that shockwave earlier. Most deviants struggled to get up after some of those, and I just stood back up like it was nothing. Sure, she didn't put her full force behind it, but it's still impressive. So, even if I do crash into anything, it'll hurt them a lot more than it'll hurt me. She begins to teach me everything she knows, and we train together for quite some time. In fact, I've been with her for so long that it's time to move into the events of Thor The Dark World. Now, while I don't really have much involvement here, since I'm busy training with Makari, my influences before have changed this story in a different way. It's finally time to head to Asgard and see what's been going on with the Hulk. Ever since making his way to Asgard in 2011, Bruce Banner has been training with Asgard's finest to get him to perfect the Hulk problem. Bruce learned from the best of the best how to calm his mind, so that even when he gets angry, the Hulk won't need to be unleashed. This is thanks to Frigga, and all the other witches that reside here. Thor introduced Bruce to his mother, and said that if anybody was to help him, it would be her, and the others like her. With Frigga's help, Bruce didn't need to worry about transforming to the Hulk anymore, though he could still transform if he wanted to. Once Bruce's training was done, it was time for the Hulks to begin. The first time he transformed, the Hulk kinda raged out, but Thor was there to knock him back down, and get him to actually communicate with them. With Thor by their side now, Frigga and the other witches began to teach Hulk to calm his mind, and become one with himself, just like how Banner could. It takes a lot longer for Hulk to be calm, but he doesn't rage out and try to attack everybody anymore. Evident when Thor had to leave to go and deal with Loki on Earth during the Avengers. Hulk still does do his favorite thing, which is to smash into battle arenas that Asgard has, and he's pretty great with the people. With all of the mental help he's received, Hulk now acts a lot like how he did in Thor Ragnarok, but a lot less angry. Hulk never really wants to revert back into Banner, but Frigga makes them swap personalities. That way they can both have their time in the sun. This isn't the perfect fusion that Frigga wants though, as sure they're both existing fine, but it would be better if both of them could come to an understanding and become truly one. Though, that is something they're gonna have to learn on their own. Now we move on to the events of Thor The Dark World proper. The majority of the movie plays out as normal, with the Dark Elves, Jane getting the Aether, and all that. The change really begins when the Dark Elves invade to go and acquire the Aether from Jane. Bruce notices the Dark Elves beginning to invade, and realizes he needs to protect his new home. So, he allows the Hulk to take over, and begin to help ward off the intruders. Hulk is able to get the majority of the attention on him, due to his roars and overwhelming power. Since Hulk is reducing the number of their forces one by one, Malekith tells Algrim to go and face him himself, while he goes to deal with Jane and Frigga. Algrim and Hulk begin their battle, with Algrim's immense power actually proving difficult for the Hulk to handle. Not too difficult though, as he's been training in combat as well with Sif and the Warriors 3, meaning Hulk can now have some strategies to his attacks. Algrim's weapons don't do anything to the Hulk, as his skin is super impervious to some measly daggers, and Hulk smashes Algrim to the ground, ripping his horns off and stabbing him with them. Hulk roars in victory, alerting Malekith that his champion is dead. He wasn't able to get Jane as Frigga made an illusion of her, and without Algrim to back him up, Malekith is alone in fighting Frigga. Frigga is no pushover, and while Malekith is strong, she can hold her own well. All she needed to do was hold him off just a little bit, and this is when Thor, Odin, and Hulk arrive to fight with Malekith. Yeah, if Malekith and Cannon couldn't beat Thor even with the Aether absorbed, I don't think he can fight off him, Odin, and Hulk all by himself. And he can't. The three of them curb stomp Malekith. And Thor deals the finishing blow by swinging a hammer at his head and breaking his neck. Frigga gets to survive through the Dark World, thanks to the help of the Hulk being around. The rest of the Dark Elves are killed by the Asgardian soldiers, and the battle is won a whole lot earlier than in canon. They didn't even need to release Loki, so he's going to be staying in his cell for a whole lot longer. With the main villain of the movie defeated, the only issue now is to get the Aether out of Jane, and they're unable to do that here. Hulk has an idea, and reverts back into Banner, saying that it's probably time for him to return to Earth, 
as there, he can work with Eric Selvig and the others to make something to contain the ether within Jane. That's really the only shot that they have. So, Bruce says goodbye to Frigga, thanking her for everything she's done for him, and the Hulk. After saying goodbye, Thor, Jane, and Bruce depart for Earth. On Earth, Bruce and the others begin to work on an ether extractor, similar to the one that Rocket used in Endgame. Since Bruce was the one to work on that in canon, I'm assuming he'd be able to make one here and now too. And if he couldn't, Thor can just go to Tony to have him help Bruce out in doing it. With that, the ether extractor is created and the ether is removed from Jane's body. With the ether in hand, Thor returns it to Asgard's treasure room, and this time, it stays on Asgard. Since the only reason it was brought to the Collector before, was that it was dangerous to have two Infinity Stones right next to each other. But now that the Tesseract is with me, there's no reason for it to leave Asgard, so it stays here. The Convergence is thwarted, and the world is saved before it ever really was in danger. Thor returns to stay with Jane on Earth, Bruce goes to introduce himself to S.H.I.E.L.D., Odin stays as the rule of Asgard with Frigga, and Loki stays locked up in prison. So, good ending for Thor the Dark World! In all that time, I continued training with Makari, and managed to increase my speed by a gigantic margin. I wasn't able to learn how to shoot Venom Blasts or anything, but I'm a lot faster, and can now use that Shockwave move to blow larger enemies away. So, if Abomination ever came back, I could throw him a far ways away this time. And, I was taught how to take off and jump several feet into the air to make myself go even faster, and then vibrate my hand fast enough to slow myself down so I can hit the ground and be okay. I'm not as fast as Makari now, but I'm really getting there. Whenever we raced, I was still able to see her ahead of me, instead of being completely left in her dust. I may even be faster than Rush Hour now, since I know for a fact that Makari is faster than him. I just have to hope he's not off somewhere training super hard to get faster himself. After learning that the events of Thor The Dark World have occurred, and thankfully went well, I know that Thor is now on Earth as well, and I'm pretty sure to be able to use electricity to my disposal like Rush Hour did, the man to help me would be the God of Thunder himself. I thank Makari for all of her help, signing that I hope she'll allow me to visit her sometimes. She signs that she'd like that, and hopefully someday I can actually beat her in a race. I smile, and speed off to go begin my training with Thor. I speed my way over to meet with Thor, after I've finished my training with Makari. Thor and Jane are happy to see me again, and Jane is pretty impressed with how far I've come as a hero with my speed, as she remembers when I was just some homeless kid who could predict the future. I tell her that, yeah, things have changed a lot, and now I gotta train to make sure some lunatic with abilities like me doesn't kill us all. I tell Thor I train with an ancient speedster to get faster. Though, I know I have latent abilities that involve lightning, since my powers technically come from a lightning bolt. If I can harness this power, I'll get a lot stronger, and who better to learn how to control thunder than from the god of thunder himself. Thor says that now that he's going to be sticking around on Earth, he has plenty of time to help me, and asks when can we begin? Now, Thor has to teach me all about harnessing lightning, and since I move so fast, lightning basically comes out anyway. I need to learn to channel that into energy and strikes. This training is a two-way one, really, as I also help Thor use lightning in the way he did in Ragnarok. So, if he loses Mjolnir, he'll still be very powerful without it. Thor tries to shoot lightning at me, and since my training with Makari, I'm faster than lightning now, and can dodge. Though, the challenge is to try and warp his lightning around and use it for myself, which is easier said than done, and it takes a while for me to get the hang of the control of thunder. Sparring with Thor using his powers of his own helps a lot too, and while it's pretty hard to damage him, putting myself into an intense one-sided match can help me activate my powers faster, which it does to some degree. With a basic understanding of how to use lightning, I can eventually redirect the ones Thor throws right back at him, by coursing it through my body and sending it back a lot faster. I can generate the power in my hands as well, but only small sparks enough to almost shock somebody, not enough to accomplish what Rush Hour did with a Venom Blast. I'm almost getting the hang of it though, and me trying to get power like this helps. Thor gets it a lot faster too. He's normally always had his hammer to help him out with everything, but with him using his thunder a lot more to help train me, he's gotten a lot more adept at using it for himself too. While he may not be able to use it as well as he does in Ragnarok, he is getting there to some degree. Only reason he can't use it at all right now is since if he gave it his all, he'd definitely kill me, and he's not in for a life or death situation like he was in Ragnarok, so he can't utilize his power to the fullest. Yet. We're definitely both getting somewhere with this though, and things are getting a lot better in the training aspect. On a break day, I turn on the news with Karis, and we see a high-speed chase involving the police going on in DC. I've always been interested in chases, but this one seems familiar, since all the cops are going after the guy driving away. Of course, we're in the events of the Winter Soldier at this point in time, so Fury is getting chased currently. 
Karis asks if we should go and save him at this point, and I begin to say that, nah, things basically need to play out this way to be able to take down Hydra within shield, and we may mess it up. That's when I get hit with a horrible realization. Fury only managed to survive getting shot in cannon since he took some of Banner's meds that slowed the heart to one beat a minute while working in shield. Though, Banner hasn't been on Earth for very long now, and since he's been getting along with the Hulk problem, that medication probably doesn't exist. And without that, if we don't do something, then Fury will die. I tell Karis that, never mind, we're gonna need to interfere and open a portal to DC. Once in DC, I wait out in the shadows in Cap's apartment until Fury slumps into it. Once he shows up, I appear in front of him and hold up a phone in specific instructions. I know the room is bugged, so I make sure to just type it all into the notes app. <laughs> I explain that the Winter Soldier is after him, and if he gets killed now, he's not gonna be saved. In order for the infiltrators of S.H.I.E.L.D. to be taken down for good, he needs to fake his death. Once the Winter Soldier shoots at him, I'll be fast enough to catch the bullets, and he needs to fake kneeling over to be taken to S.H.I.E.L.D. and have them fake his death, that way we can expose who is the leader of HYDRA within S.H.I.E.L.D. Fury realizes I haven't laid him astray yet, and while he still doesn't fully trust me since I know a lot more than I realize, he knows my heart's in the right place, and he'll trust me. Things go exactly where I want them to, with Fury getting fake shot, Cap going after Winter Soldier, and Fury being declared deceased, but being taken to a safe location. Karis and I don't interfere too much with the events of Winter Soldier, besides from that, as if we do too much then we could influence the Helicarriers being risen early, and killing us all. We do have a plan though. The events all play out the same up until the battle with the Winter Soldier on the highway, and Cap realizing that the man in front of him is his former best friend, Bucky. Once he realizes that, I gather Black Widow, Falcon, and Cap together, while Karis opens a portal underneath them, sending them to Fury's current location. Bucky looks on confused as I speed all around him, getting rid of his weapons he has hidden, and then knocking him into Karis' portal. Once Karis and I go through too, Bucky tries to fight us all off, but Karis has a plan to help. I tell Cap not to worry, and that Bucky's being brainwashed right now, but we can save him. While Karis is at the end of time and training her classic Loki, she explained to him about Sylvie's ability to go into somebody's mind and play around in there, getting information, inserting herself in other people's memories, and bringing about memories that people don't remember. As demonstrated by the variant Loki in his show, all Lokis have an ability like this, which means that the classic Loki would too. With Karis describing it to him, he would have time to learn this power as well, and in turn teach it to Karis, who was an honorary Loki. With Karis having this ability herself now, she can use it on Bucky to go into his mind and try and force the real Bucky out and repel the Hydra brainwashing. Karis shuffles around his memories, which are hidden away good, but thankfully, Steve is there as well to help his friend through the pain, and with him and Karis working together, they're able to bring his memories about who he is to the forefront and make him remember he is really Bucky Barnes. Bucky screams out, finally remembering everything again. He weakly asks if it's really Steve, and he tears up, saying it's really him. The two hug, finally reunited after almost 70 years. Bucky's Hydra control is still in there somewhere. And if anybody were to say the magic words from Zemo now, then he'd definitely go off. But Karis just brought his James Buchanan Barnes side out after being repressed for 70 years. Though, he still remembers almost all of the evil acts he's committed while under Hydra's control. With Bucky as a star witness to Alexander Pierce's evil, they're able to expose him as an agent of Hydra. And all of the others who are agents, such as Rumlo, have all been arrested for treason under S.H.I.E.L.D. With all these guys behind bars, the Zola algorithm is thwarted and called off. And just to really make sure that S.H.I.E.L.D. doesn't bring it back, I made a personal call to Thor, and he showed up to destroy the Helicarriers himself. What are they gonna do? Arrest Thor? <laughs> Fury is brought back in to become the director again, and most of Hydra's sleeper agents are revealed to the public by Bucky, and going through Pierce's computer. Everything gets worked out nicely with Bucky now on the hero side, and there not being a huge amount of collateral damage with the helicarriers, meaning Rumlow doesn't become crossbones with a building falling on his face, and Ross doesn't have something he can add to push the Sokovia Accords further. Cap manages to take Bucky in, and with the help of the literal Captain America, Nick Fury, and most of the brainwashing tech revealed to the Hydra agents, Bucky is pardoned of his crimes due to brainwashing from Hydra, and is now a free man in society once more. A lot earlier than normal. Just letting you know, Bucky being a free man here, and staying with Steve to get readjusted to society, is going to cause some major differences down the road. Kara still needs to stay with him sometimes to use her magic to wipe most of the programming from his head, but for right now, he's really Bucky again, and the Winter Soldier is no more. The Winter Soldier finished, I continue my training with Thor, and during a serious sparring session, it finally happens. Thor shoots a large amount of electricity my way, and I tank it all to try and throw it all back at him. Though, he threw a lot more than I anticipated, and I'm not able to throw it all back. The power coursing through me is too much, and I'm beginning to fade. Not yet though, I think. I'm not through yet. 
I scream out and unleash all the electricity from my body, blowing back Thor by the sheer pressure I emit. He looks back and smiles. We've done it. I look back at myself and notice all the energy surrounding me. My hair is standing up, electricity is all around me, and I'm glowing. Thor says to give it a shot, and I raise my hand and blast a bolt of lightning up into the sky. I smile and continue to shoot more from my hands all around. I jump up in excitement and begin to run around, using my lightning hands to propel myself even faster as well, making me a lot faster than before. I'm very happy. With this new power of mine, even somebody as fast as Rush Hour doesn't stand a chance. At the end of Winter Soldier, those at Strucker's base worry about being discovered by the authorities, since everything about Hydra is leaked online. But Strucker tells them not to worry, as with Loki's scepter, they manage to create a force more powerful than even Captain America, the twins. However, as he goes to see them, he notices that their cells are empty. They're gone. Strucker immediately sounds the alarm to find the twins and return them here now, though they are long gone. On the outside, Wanda and Pietro are dropped to the ground in an icy forest. Wanda sits up and asks Pietro what he thinks he's doing running and bringing them all the way out here. Pietro says he didn't do anything and thought she did something to bring them here. A voice behind them says they're both wrong and that he brought them here. The two turn around to see Rush Hour, saying that he was the one who broke them out. Wanda asks him who he is and what he wants with them. Rush Hour laughs, saying he doesn't want anything to do with her, and points to Pietro, saying that he wants to use him to get back at somebody else. After harnessing my lightning abilities, training has slowly winded down, and I take a break from pushing myself all the time, so that way I can try and prepare for Rush Hour's imminent return. Though, as a superhero, it's hard to just sit around and relax, as I still gotta try to go and help out people. Karis and I do a great job as the Heroes of New York, where we're really seen as its permanent protector, so that's awesome. I've been struggling with something in my head, though, as we're nearing the time frame of Guardians of the Galaxy. I want to go out there and help save everybody during the attack on Xandar, but I'm really worried about pushing ourselves out there into Thanos' radar even more, since again, if he comes here early, I don't think we're ready to stop him. Karis tells me that while that is a risk, Thanos already knows about the Avengers anyways, and doubts that he'll start his plan till his original time frame, since there were more Avengers there than in canon, so he'd need more power to be able to deal with all of us. Thanos shouldn't be any problem if he shows up without all the Infinity Stones. I tell her she's right, and she wants to come with me to help out and save a lot of lives, which she responds to by putting on her Violet Knight costume. Now, to be able to save many more people, the two of us can't just go in alone, as that wouldn't be much help. So, I go to the biggest heavy hitter I know, Thor, and ask him if he wants to help out in saving the Nova Corps from Ronin. Thor is always up for a good challenge like this, and agrees to come with us. With Thor on our side, we should be able to save a lot more people, though not nearly enough. This calls for somebody with a history with Ronin, who would be able to know the ins and outs of his ship. I zip over to Nick Fury and tell him that there's a huge alien conflict out in space right now with the Kree, and if he remembers who they are. Fury tells me that yes he does, and asks me how I know about them. I lie and tell him that Thor told me, and how I remember reading in the files that Captain Marvel dealt with them and defended the Earth from them, so the best person to help us take a powerful one out for good is her. Fury has no reason not to call her now, since these were the people that controlled her in the past, so this would be personal, so she definitely need this. He takes out his pager and calls her in, so now all we gotta do is wait. All of us wait to the location we called her to, and suddenly, Carol Danvers, the Captain Marvel, lands in front of us, asking Fury what's the matter. Fury explains what I said about the Kree, and I introduce myself to her, saying I read how she fought with Ronin back in the day, and he's going to hurt a lot of people if we don't have her help. She says that she's had quite a few run-ins with Ronin over the years, and she's been helping the Nova Corps for a long while now. She would love to help. She introduces herself to Karis and Thor, and her and Thor specifically definitely get along right away, which is cool to see. She asks us how we plan on getting there, and Thor says that with the Bifrost, we can all get there instantly, so the huddle close. Carol tells Fury that we'll be back after the mission, and not to wait up. Thor uses the Bifrost to send us straight to the Nova Corps, and all of us almost throw up, especially me, since I'm not used to not being on my feet. The Nova Corps let us in since we're all with Captain Marvel, and we had the Nova Prime to tell her about how we got intel of Ronin the Accuser coming to invade this planet. Nova Prime tells us that they just got the same message from somebody called Star-Lord, and that if Captain Marvel herself is informing them, then they'll definitely get in a position to help out. It's so surreal for Karazana to be on another planet, and see different kinds of people on it. Sure, we've literally traveled dimensions before, but to be out in space on another one is cool to take in. No time for sightseeing though, as Karis and I need to stay on the ground to evacuate the city. Karis opens a portal far away as I begin to grab people off the street and bring them through, that way they can be out of harm's way. 
Thor and Captain Marvel head into the sky to meet up with the Ravengers and the Guardians of the Galaxy. The Nova Corps arrives too to help, and Thor and Carol fly around destroying the ships to clear the way for the Milano to infiltrate Ronin's ship. The Guardians are able to enter the ship much easier this time, and Yondu is able to stay in the air due to Thor destroying all the ships around him, so he can make it. More ships fly towards the city, but that's when I transform and begin to shoot my lightning towards them and destroy them while saving people. Karis is able to telekinetically throw the rubble at them, and even push the ships into each other for that matter to blow them up. She can even open plenty of portals all around, that way I can shoot my lightning into them and take out many ships at once. While fighting, Karis sees that Nebula is attempting to escape, and opens a portal right in front of her ship, and has her fly directly into the ground. Karis grabs Nebula out, and the two then begin to fight. Nebula goes to attack her normally, but Karis is able to block the blows by using her telekinesis to stop them in their tracks. She shoots out her green energy to blow her away, and slams her into the ground. Nebula goes to stab at her, but she blocks it with her own dagger, and then sends him around to circle Nebula, and slash all around her to weaken her. Kara says that she can help her defeat Thanos, all she has to do is just stay here and listen to them. Nebula doesn't want anything to do with this anymore and says she'll kill Thanos her own way, but Kara knows that's not going to work out for her, and decides to just give her to Gamora after this. Kara lifts a large piece of the ship into the air and throws it down on Nebula to pin her there, and says she'll come back for her later. Though Kara knows that with Nebula down, Ronin is about to bring down a whole lot of Nova Corps ships, and tells Carol that she needs to get in there now and stop them. Up in the sky, Carol tells Thor to handle the rest of these ships, and she's gotta go and stop Ronin. Carol flies into the ship and knocks Ronin down before he can blast away the ships. Ronin says that he remembers her, and at this time, he's more than powerful enough to stop her. He's right too, since as we saw in Endgame, Carol can be damaged by the Power Stone, so this fight is a tough one for her as she battles a powered up Ronin. As the two clash, the Guardians show up and blast directly at Ronin sending him flying back. This gives Carol the edge she needs to fire all she's got at his hammer and try and get the Power Stone away from him. Her attack shatters the hammer and the Shockwave sends her and Ronin back. The Power Stone begins to go crazy and Peter jumps in to stop it before it brings the whole ship down. Once he grabs it though, its power begins to overwhelm him. But just like in the movie, Gamora, Drax, and this time, Groot, I'll go over to put their hands on him as well, and Ronan asks them how they can hold an Infinity Stone since they're mortal. Peter comes up with the coolest name off the top of his head, and says it's because they're the frickin' Guardians of the Galaxy, and extends his hand to disintegrate Ronan. With Ronan dead, they've won, but the damage done by the Power Stone is too great and the ship begins to go down. The Nova Corps all fly away from the ship to avoid killing themselves, and the Guardians all look on as the ship goes to crash. That's when Captain Marvel reappears, and grabs all of them, telling them to hold on as she gets them out of there. Carol flies right out of the ship with the Guardians in tow, and tells Karis to open a portal. Karis opens the portal under them, and the Guardians safely fall to the ground, with Groot not needing to sacrifice himself. Yeah, Groot gets to actually survive this movie, and while that means we won't be getting a baby Groot, the original gets to live and stay with the Guardians. Thor and Carol finish up with the last of Ronin's fleet and return to the ground, the battle being won, and a whole lot of innocent lives being saved. Yondu still goes to take the Power Stone from Quill, and Carol goes to kill him for trying to take it, but I tell her to trust him, and he knows what he's doing. Quill gives Yondu the fake Power Stone container, and the Ravagers leave, meaning that the day is now truly saved. The Nova Corps thanks all of us for coming to their aid, and pardons all of the Guardians for their past criminal records. It's nice how I get to meet the Guardians of the Galaxy, and Quill says that Karis and I got some sick costumes and loves our superhero names. That's always nice to hear, and we tell him he's got a badass name too, and an excellent taste in music. Karis gives Nebula over to Gamora, and Gamora says that she'll stay in their custody, since they need to talk things out and try and have her get over her fear of Thanos. The Guardians depart to Xandar, and Thor once again opens it to Bifrost so all of us can return to Earth. Fury asks us how the mission went, and of course, it was an absolute success. Carol thanks us for calling her, and says that if we ever need anything else from her, to call, since it was great working together. Captain Marvel then blasts off to parts unknown, and that ends Guardians of the Galaxy. I tell Karis it was a good idea to go off and fight, since we saved a lot of people, and made a bunch of new friends, and powerful allies. Now, if you've seen my MCU timeline video, you know that Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 was actually a few months after the first one, so we got ahead of the events of that one next. After the battle on Xandar, I'm pretty sure that Nebula would be reformed to some degree, as we could tell she was already under ropes with turning against Thanos in the first movie, and also by her depressing line in Endgame of, he won't let me. So with all the Guardians around to support her and assure what happened to Gamora, they'd be able to at least get her on their side. After her and Gamora have another fight, of course, since that worked nice in Volume 2. Speaking of Volume 2, to get into the events of that movie, the Guardians would all fight on the Sovereign, and this time we'd have the original Groot and Nebula to help fight, so it would go a lot faster. 
Obviously, instead of Nebula's reward, they'd probably get a lot of units. Things from here would play out around the same with Ego showing up and revealing himself as Quill's father. From here, once the Ravengers arrive, Rocket, Groot, and Nebula would all be working together to fight them off, and would most likely win against everybody until Yondu shows up to stop them. When it comes to Yondu, Groot could be the one to take the brunt of his arrow, as we know how durable he is, and we would probably get stuck inside of him, and he can just grab it and break it. From there, Rocket or Nebula could beat him down, and Rocket can ask him what he knows about Quill's father, as he knows he was hired to bring him to him, and wants to know what the deal is. Yondu reveals what Ego has done, and this obviously shocks everybody there, and they decide to take in Yondu with them, and leave the others there to go after Ego. Everything on Ego's planet happens as normal, except for Nebula going to kill Gamora, and this is when, on Earth, Karis and I are just vibing at Dairy Queen in Missouri, waiting for that plant to go off and corrupt the planet. Once it does, I'm able to speed everybody out of the Dairy Queen and out of the area in total, and once the corruption stops, I tell Karis it's time to go and help out. She pulls out the old temp pad, and asks if this is actually gonna work. I tell her, I hope so, and put my finger on it, attempting to use my electricity to charge it up so it can work again. But since I've seen Shazam, I know not to use too much. Once it's all charged up, she types in the coordinates for Ego's planet at this exact moment in time, and we step through the doorway to go and help. We land on the surface and wait for the Sovereign to show up, and once they do, we blast them with everything we have. They obviously weren't expecting others like us to be here, and all we gotta do is hold them off and make sure they don't stop the Guardians from drilling into the core. Though, with us stepping foot into the planet, Ego now knows where we are, and binds our legs, sucking us into the planet. I transform to blow away the ground beneath me, but Ego's ground is too thick and we begin to get sucked in. Karis tries to blast away at it, but it seems like we're not going to be able to get out of it. We begin to panic, but there is one more thing I can try to do to get us out of there. I close my eyes and begin to vibrate. I shake faster and faster, until I begin to phase through Ego's tendrils, and fall myself through the ground. Thankfully, my training with Makari made me a lot faster in my overall body structure as well, and not just how fast I run. With her training, I can now vibrate my molecules at such a rate that I can phase through objects. It's extremely tiring, but for situations like these, I need it. I phase through the ground and zip back up to pull Karis out and save her too. Luckily, since I'm so fast, the Sovereign didn't have time to go into the core yet, and we can still hold them off while avoiding Ego. All this is happening while the Guardians are blasting away at his core, and while Ego is trying to attack them too, the others can blast away at him to avoid the ship being damaged. Once Karis and I are done with the Sovereign, we head down to the core to help out too, and I grab Mantis and bring her to a crack in the ground so she can put Ego to sleep to buy us some time. Once that's done, the Guardians are able to burn to the core enough, where once Ego wakes up and tries to kill them all himself, it's too late, and Quill can shoot the remains with his blaster, and it'll blow up Ego. With the core of Ego destroyed, he turns into sand and dusts away. And now it's time to get out of here. Luckily, since everybody is on the ship, we can all make it off to the planet before it explodes, which means Yondu also gets to survive. He is definitely a wanted man from the Ravagers now, since most of them got arrested once the Nova Corps arrested him, but he's got the Guardians of the Galaxy to protect him. And he worked with the Quill on his mission, and the two bonded over fighting together again. So they have a healthier relationship now, even without him needing to die. After we all take a breather, Karis talks to Nebula, saying how she told her she was just trying to help before, and Nebula thanks her, but asks why we keep showing up everywhere they go. Karis laughs, saying that we just have some good intel, and want to help out as much as she can. She shakes her hand and tells her not to worry, as we'll make sure that Thanos doesn't do anything to harm her ever again. With another goodbye, we tell the Guardians we'll see them all again someday, and Karis opens up a portal so we can head home. With the Guardians movies completed, we can now head into the events of Age of Ultron. The Avengers have been getting reports of Loki's scepter's location. It's mostly been a bunch of dead ends with arms dealers not really enjoying being taken down, but this time it's for real, off at Strucker's base. Since this feels like it's going to be a big struggle, all of the Avengers from before are called in, with a few exceptions. Black Panther is unable to return, as he is still protecting the homeland of Wakanda, though in his place we have new recruits, the Hulk, Violet Knight, the Falcon, and the Winter Soldier. Bruce has been around in the Avengers base to help ever since the events of the Dark World, and has grown close to everybody on the team, and shows off his ability to control the Hulk in battles, meaning we don't need a lullaby from Natasha to calm him down anymore. And obviously Karis would come along too, since she's extremely powerful, and I wouldn't be able to go without her anyways. For Bucky and Sam, Bucky has been reintroduced into society now, and is helping out Cap in becoming a better man, and righting the wrongs of his past, similar to what he was trying to do in his show. Falcon is there since he has no need to go and search for Bucky anymore, as he's right there with them, so he has a lot more time to go off and be fighting with the big boys. 
the Avengers head off to Sokovia and invade Strucker's base, attempting to get the Scepter back. It's very fun to be fighting alongside the Avengers again, and while it's cool to see Karis have some team attacks with the others, I'm on the lookout for Quicksilver showing up, since my plan here is to get them to come with us earlier, as with my speed, I can definitely show it off to Quicksilver and he'd be interested to come with us and probably not die in the end. But, he never shows up. At least, not when he's supposed to. As we're fighting, I speed around fighting off the soldiers, waiting for him to appear, but nothing. I hang around Hawkeye as I know he's the first one to be attacked by him, but still nothing. I begin to get very concerned. Did me showing up here cause something terrible to happen to the Maximoffs? Did they never show up to get their powers in the first place? Did, did they die to the experiments? All of the thoughts fly through my head, and I need answers. Once Iron Man is able to break into Strucker's base, I zoom in and grab Strucker, slamming him into the wall. I ask him where the twins are, and he looks confused, which concerns me even more. I lift up my arm, vibrating it at super speed, saying I'll put it right through his chest if he doesn't answer me. Strucker blurts out that they escaped over a year ago, and he hasn't been able to track them down ever since. Escaped? That's impossible. That's not what happened in the movie. Oh god, what is happening? Cap comes in and tells me to put him down, we need him alive, and I drop him to the ground and tell him something is very wrong. I speed away back to Karis and she seems as concerned as me. I tell her that they're not here. Karis asks me how that's possible. Even with all the changes we made, we haven't interacted with them, so how can they suddenly decide to break out this time? I tell her I have no idea, but this is a huge issue. Once we get the scepter, we need to try and figure this out. Tony is able to retrieve the scepter this time without having any visions from Wanda, so he just grabs it and we manage to capture those at the compound and fly back to the Avengers Tower. On the way back, Cap asked me what I meant by something being very wrong, as we managed to get the scepter back okay. I try to explain that there are these two twins who are supposed to be at Strucker's base, the twins called Wanda and Pietro Maximoff. I uh, read in the files that they were supposedly enhanced by Loki's scepter, but they were nowhere to be found. If we don't find them, they're gonna cause a lot of trouble. Cap tells me not to worry about it too much. I'm the fastest thing alive. I'm sure if they show up, I'll be able to apprehend them without much trouble. Even this reassurance from Cap doesn't help me feel any better, and the fact that they're gone just keeps going through my head. Once we return to the Avengers Tower, I have Hill search all the databases for the twins, and while she finds that they were indeed enhanced by Strucker, they disappeared months ago and haven't been found since. This is the first time where something has changed for the worst. Everything, ever since I got here, has played out exactly as it should have, exactly on schedule. Not now though, and this terrifies the crap out of me. We need to get out there and find them. If they both die, well, if Pietro dies, that's what's supposed to happen. But if Wanda dies, that can change the entire future of this universe for the worst. She can't die, we need to get out there. Of course, not all of the Avengers can come, but Black Widow and Hawkeye say they'll help Karis and I out once we get this whole deal with the Scepter behind us, since they're spies and it's their job to find people. Oh yeah, the Scepter. Ultron. Karis and I wonder what can we possibly do there to prevent Ultron. Well, short answer, we can't. Long answer, we can try and convince Tony not to mess with the Scepter, but some way, somehow, he's going to find a way to make Ultron anyways, and we're not tech guys, so we can't even help them try and make him good. So, all we have to do is just hope that we can defeat him in the end, and even without Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch. Three days pass, and Tony throws a party to celebrate retrieving the Scepter, and while everybody is off having a good time, Karis and I are sitting in a corner, very worried about the whereabouts of the twins, until the party is cut short as normal. Or, at least what I think is as normal. No. Wait, that red energy? That's not Ultron. A red energy beam blasts through the wall, and two flashes zip into attack. No, it can't be. I speed in front to stop them and get knocked back into the wall. The others look on and wonder who the hell these people are. Karis looks on in fear. She knows exactly who they are. Rush Hour turns to her and laughs, saying she's really made a name for herself out there joining the Super Friends, but he's made some friends of his own. He introduces his protégés, Wanda and Pietro Maximoff. He's made sure to train this boy himself to be a better speedster than even old Speedy Boy over there, and this one sure does have fire in his blood. So he promised him if he helped him kill Speed Demon, then they could kill Tony Stark. Stark wonders why Jarvis's security alarm didn't go off to alert the others of what is happening, but there's no time to think now, and they need to stop these guys. Quicksilver turns to Tony and grins, rushing over there until they intercept him, and ask what he's doing with somebody like that. This isn't... this isn't supposed to happen. 
Quicksilver says, this is what's supposed to happen. He's been told about the fraud that I am, how I'm nothing compared to Nomen, and this will be the day that I die. Quicksilver is on me faster than I anticipated. He's a lot faster now than he was in his movie. How did I not see this coming? Of course Rush Hour go after the next speedster and have him turn against the heroes. I fight out with Quicksilver while the others try to hold off Rush Hour and Wanda. Karis and Wanda blast each other with their energies. Karis is luckily being the stronger of the two. The two throw magic and objects at each other, and since Wanda hasn't had the training with the powers that Karis has, Karis has the upper hand here. Though, she isn't just fighting Wanda, as Rush Hour goes around and attacks the others to get to me. He still is a fan of the Avengers who doesn't want to kill them, only me, so he doesn't just kill them right away. He rushes over and zaps all of the non-superpowered people in the room, and knocks them unconscious. Even Bruce is unconscious before he knows what is happening, and he can't turn to the Hulk. Thor is able to slow him down by shooting at him with his lightning, but once Rush Hour is hit, he just absorbs its power and shoots it back at Thor. With all of us struggling here, matters are made worse once Ultron makes his presence known, and sends members of the Iron Legion out to kill the others. Rush Hour sees Ultron make his presence known, and sees that he's trying to kill them all. Now, Rush Hour has grown up idolizing the Avengers, and doesn't exactly want them dead, so he makes sure none of them die while fighting the Iron Legion bots. Ultron sees Rush Hour so conflicted, and his main form right now tells him that they seem to want the same things. As the two begin to talk, I've had enough of dealing with the new and improved Quicksilver, and transform, blasting him off of me. After that, I speed over and destroy Ultron, and fight out with Rush Hour. Him and I fight blow for blow, and he says that I've gotten a lot faster since we've last met, and now I actually have a chance. I won't let him get the better of me this time, and since I've trained a lot more powerful people, I have the edge. As we battle it out, Rush Hour seems to know he's outclassed as he can barely land a hit, and he smiles as Quicksilver runs in and slams into me, knocking me back. That's why he brought a partner. The two come at me together, and while I am a lot faster now, having two of these guys against me isn't good. My lightning only works on Quicksilver, but it has no effect on Rush Hour, so I'm not standing any chance. Luckily, Thor is still standing and comes in to get them off of me. Rush Hour knows he's not a match for Thor, so he tells Quicksilver to grab his sister and get out of there. They'll meet up with somebody afterwards and finally get their revenge then. Quicksilver knocks down Karis, grabs Wanda, and all of them speed out of there. I struggle to stand, attempting to go after them, but Thor tells me not to since I'm in no condition to fight them now. I try to go after them anyways, but by the time I leave the building, they're long out of my sight. I don't have the strength to chase after them. I collapse to the ground and scream out, letting all of the lightning surge out of my body as I slam my fists against the ground. Once everybody is woken back up, we discuss our situation. Ultron has killed Jarvis, hacked into the internet, and is planning to kill all of the Avengers. And he was talking with Rush Hour, somebody who could take out 90% of the team without batting an eye. If these guys team up, then they stand no chance. Even I couldn't handle two speedsters on my own. If we had another, that would be a different story, but the way things are now, the odds are not in our favor. I have mentally checked out now, and am blaming myself for being so stupid and letting Rush Hour get away and train Quicksilver. He's far worse than he was originally, and who knows if him and Wanda are ever going to turn a new leaf now. Karis tries to make me feel better, saying this isn't our fault, it's his. We need to stop him before anyone else gets hurt. He's using his knowledge to his advantage, so we need to fight back with ours. Back in Sokovia, Rush Hour, Quicksilver, and Wanda meet up with where Ultron told them to meet up. They explain their own goals with one another, with Ultron able to manipulate Rush Hour the same way that he himself manipulated Quicksilver. The bad guys are humanity, and to truly save humanity, they need to destroy it. Rush Hour dealt with this a lot in his future, all of the terrible threats to humanity. No matter what he did, there is always a new villain around, constantly. There were new threats every single day. Speed Demon was wrong in not killing, since killing is the only way to fix all the problems in his mind. They need to make sure this race is extinct. Quicksilver has been swayed by Rush Hour for over a year now, with him appealing to his parents' deaths and training him to be so much faster than before, and promising to always protect his sister. He broke them both out of Struckers for a reason. This must be that reason. He'll have his back. Wanda is a little more on the defensive, as while she wasn't told to hold the story humanity thing, she trusts her brother, and Rush Hour, in turn, trusts Ultron. She'll follow them in doing whatever they have to do. Their first order of business, make Ultron as strong as he can be. I know that Ultron will be making his way to Claw to get the Vibranium resources for a new body, so we need to be prepared to make a stand to stop him there. Since we have his number now, I call T'Challa and inform him of Claw's location, and to go and help us take him down for good. 
Once Rush Hour and the others show up, Black Panther and Adora Milaje are there as well, and try to fight them all off. Unfortunately, they can't do much. Black Panther fights with Ultron as the others all instantly take out the Dora Milaje before they can get the Claw, with most of them being killed by Rush Hour and Quicksilver, which includes the death of the General, Okoye. Karis used a temp pad to open a portal here so we can get there faster, and once we rush in, the Dora are already dead. And in a rage, I attack Rush Hour once more, asking him what he's done, and this time he's not going to make it out of here alive. The other Avengers come in to make sure that Quicksilver stays away from Noman. As the two team up on me, I'm done for. Though, that's easier said than done, as there are attacks from all sides by Claw's men and the Ultron bots. Wanda attempts to infiltrate their minds like before, but Karis is able to counter this with her own magic and fight off the witch. Karis tries to convince her that the others are crazy, and she'll end up destroying humanity if she stays on this path. Wanda isn't going to let her brother down though, and continues to fight. Since my head is filled with so much rage and it's blindsiding me, I completely miss an Ultron bot stealing the vibranium and making his way off the parts unknown. With how angry I am, Rush Hour is able to easily take me on even with all the training I've done. Since I'm usually so collected, these things are normally easy, but not this time. Quicksilver is able to take out the grounded Avengers, and once the vibranium is gone, he makes a tornado around the building to catch everybody off guard. And once Karis is flung away, Wanda throws her magic straight towards the ground, to knock her unconscious, then uses her magic to mess with everybody's mind, even Hawkeye this time, since he's being thrown around by Quicksilver's tornado. Wanda even gets into my mind with my back turned, and I scream out as I try to stop it, but Rush Hour laughs and disappears in front of me as the illusions start filling my head. I see visions of my parents and my friends from the real world, asking me how could I abandon them to live in a fantasy world, taking myself and Karis away from them. Visions of their lives, broken, with me and her gone. Then visions of Thanos and Rush Hour, standing over countless corpses of the Avengers, and then constantly killing Karis, and then rewinding time to kill her again, laughing maniacally. I can't stop them. I try to get to them, but I just keep running into walls and hurting myself. I'm not the only one though, as Hulkbuster still has to be deployed to stop the Hulk, and once he's taken care of, they need to get myself too, since I'm going full psycho. Once I'm knocked out by the Hulkbuster, all of the Avengers go to escape Wakanda. Karis tries to use her own magic to get rid of the visions in everybody's heads, which partially works for almost everybody, but some are worse than others, myself included. All of us have been defeated. With the Avengers out of commission, the villains are able to go to Korea unchecked and begin the process for creating Ultron's vision. With Helen Cho under the influence of Loki's scepter and Rush Hour and Quicksilver able to get her everything she needs as fast as humanly possible, this vision of Ultron is able to be made faster than in canon, and it's time for Ultron's consciousness to be transferred into it. Wanda doesn't even get the chance to try and read the vision's mind, as once Ultron plugs his head into it, Rush Hour offers to charge it up for him to make the process go by much faster than before. As we saw in the movie, Thor's lightning was able to make the upload time much quicker. So, with Rush Hour doing the same thing, Ultron is able to transfer his consciousness into the Vision's body and take it over. This time, Ultron has successfully managed to achieve his Vision and is now even stronger than before. With the Mind Stone in his possession, there is no firewall on Earth that can stop him from unleashing the nukes on this planet, but Rush Hour stops him before doing that saying that he can do that after they kill the Avengers themselves, which Ultron is all for, and I just need to wait for the others to show up here and stop them. Once Karis has fully healed all of our minds, we'll prepare to head to Korea to prevent Ultron from joining with the Vision, and this time, since we'll be in a much more open space, we should be able to stop him. Karis uses the Tempad to bring us all there, and once we step out, we see horrors beyond our imagination. Hundreds of Ultron bots flying throughout the city, destroying everything. How did he make so many so fast? Then we get our answer. Ultron, as Vision, flies down in front of us with the others right behind him. Karis and I can't believe what we're seeing. Ultron is able to transfer his consciousness into the Vision? That means the Vision that was supposed to appear never can now, and he has access to destroy the world with nukes. Karis goes to open a portal to get to the Nexus Internet Hub, but Rush Hour goes to distract me, and as he does, Quicksilver takes a tempad from her and destroys it. The Ultron bots come in to attack the Avengers, with there being 
many more of those even in Sokovia. All of us fight to the best of our ability, with there being way too many enemies on every side. As I try my best transform to fight Rush Hour and Quicksilver, I see my first casualty. Black Widow is pierced through the heart with an Ultron bot beam and collapses to the ground, dead. Hulk roars in rage at this and goes after them to destroy the bot, when Ultron uses his phasing to put his hand right through Hulk's head and rematerializes it inside. His arm now through Hulk's head, his brain destroyed, the Hulk is gone. No, I think, this can't be happening. Why is this all going so wrong? It's not only them either. Ultron and his bots take out the others in a similar fashion. Hawkeye, Captain America, Iron Man, Black Panther, Falcon, Bucky, everyone is falling. I'm too helpless to stop this. As all of the Avengers are killed in front of me, I'm too hung up on Rush Hour and Quicksilver beating down. I can't save them. Karis eventually can blast them off of me and come in to put a barrier around us as everybody tries to burst through. Crying, we both tell each other that we're sorry as we hear laughing from all around. The only one not laughing is Wanda, who looks at the carnage all around her in disgust. Rather than amusement like her brother, she is disgusted and believes that this has gone way too far. She blasts at Ultron to get her off of them and says this isn't what she wanted. She only wanted Stark dead, not all of these innocent people. Quicksilver tells her to stop attacking him as she doesn't know what she's doing. And Ultron appears behind her, sticking his hand right through her chest to take her down as well. Quicksilver's heart stops once he sees this. Wanda, no, what has he done? He screams out in complete rage and attacks Ultron, until another hand goes through his chest, this time not belonging to Ultron. Quicksilver slowly turns to see Rush Hour behind him, laughing. He tells him he's really sorry for this, but he only needed his help in taking down Speed Demon, but it seems that won't be necessary anymore. Quicksilver sheds a tear, not believing what he's done, and falls to the ground right next to his sister dead as well. Karis and I watch in horror as they turn to us, and Karis tells me we need to get out of here now. I go to grab her and run away, until Ultron lifts a piece of rubble into the air to smack me away, and then pulls in Karis close. Ultron has her by the throat, and Rush Hour appears behind me, grabbing me and forcing me to watch. I scream at Ultron to stop, not to hurt her, and I try to vibrate out of Rush Hour's hold but he vibrates as well to make sure I'm always stuck in his grasp. Ultron then squeezes and snaps her neck. Karis falls to the ground, gone. I stare at her body, unmoving. I can't believe what I'm looking at. This isn't happening. This isn't happening. This isn't happening! My body begins to vibrate like crazy. Electricity shooting all around me. I'm in a blind rage. My mind broken and gone. I let out a roar so loud that all of the Ultron bots around me crumble away into nothing, while Ultron and Rush Hour are blown back. My mind is gone, and I run around unthinking, running faster and faster. I keep going, all around the planet, hundreds of times over, screaming at the top of my lungs, the vibrations of my voice breaking everything around. Rush Hour tries to follow me, but can't catch up as I'm moving way too fast and chaotically. As I run, the world around me begins to blur and blur. The colors all begin to fade, and the madness begins to set in. I see Karis' broken body once more, and I let out one more roar that shatters the world all around me. Literally. I see the world shatter into a million pieces as I run through what looks like glass. I begin to move through the glass until I break through a panel and tumble all through the ground, skidding all across the dirt and slamming into a nearby tree. I lay there sobbing and shaking, still traumatized by what I just saw before me, until my body begins to burn up even more, and the lightning around me shifts in and out. I have no idea what's happening, but I feel that the energy in this part of the world is different. How is that possible? Suddenly, I see somebody running towards me incredibly fast, and I grit my teeth. I go to strike until I'm knocked down before I even realize what just happened. I tell him to just go ahead and end it. I'm not going to fight anymore. But instead of Rush Hour's voice I hear, I hear one that I'd never thought I would. He says, Whoa buddy, 
calm down there. I think you've got the wrong guy. No, it can't be. I turn my head and look up. Before my eyes, I see Quicksilver. The Evan Peters Quicksilver. Asking who the hell I am. Quicksilver? What? How is that possible? This is a joke. What, what the hell is wrong with today? Quicksilver looks at me and is extremely confused on seeing me tweak out. Are you okay? He asks. No, of course I'm not okay. All my friends and my girlfriend were just brutally killed by Ultron, and for some reason now I'm talking to him? How did I get here? Quicksilver says that he just saw me appear out of nowhere at super speed and didn't think anybody else could move as fast as him. He's pretty happy to finally talk to somebody fast like him, but he was hoping I'd be less of a psycho. I try to cool my head and ask him what year is it and what he's doing here. He laughs and tells me that it's 1983. 1983? Oh my god, you're actually kidding me right now. I somehow managed to both run into another universe and back in time all at once. Now I'm in the X-Men universe? This is unreal. I managed to cross the multiverse. It makes sense how the multiverse is a thing now since there isn't a TVA anymore thanks to Rush Hour. Rush Hour. This whole mess is his fault. And he's still out there with Ultron, probably gonna kill the rest of humanity. As cool as it is to meet my hero, I can't stay here. I need to get back into the MCU. Though, right as I go to ask for help, I get hit with another realization. I ask Quicksilver if he's gonna go meet with Professor X right now, and he says, yeah, his mom told him it'd be for the best. My face turns white, and I'm not gonna let any more people die today. I tell him to quickly follow me there, and I speed off. Once I arrive at the mansion, I immediately head to the basement and see Havoc shoot out a generator to blow the mansion up. Quicksilver runs up next to me and says that doesn't look good, and that we should probably get these guys out of here. I look over to him and smile. Of course, I say, and we both rush off to get everyone out of the mansion. I'm in the sweet dream scene, oh my god. We run all around making sure to get absolutely everybody out, and thankfully one of the first people I grabbed was Havoc, so he actually gets to survive this time. Once we both get everybody, I yell out and collapse to the ground. Quicksilver asks me if I'm alright, and I say that I may have overdid a little. I did just cross universes, so maybe participating in a mansion sweet dreams rescue was a little too much. Plus, my electricity is all out of whack right now, probably because I'm in another dimension with different rules. Now I know how Electro felt in No Way Home. It's cool to look up and see Beast and Mystique. I actually did show up in the X-Men universe. I couldn't have come at a worse time, since this is when Apocalypse is messing with everything. But I'm here, so I have to do something. If I could stand up now, then maybe I'd be able to help and save more people. Though, Stryker's helicopter comes down, and I know what happens next. So I try to shoot it down with my electricity, but I'm too low on power right now when nothing comes out. I tell Quicksilver to quickly get everybody out of here, but it's too late and the shockwaves come out to knock us all unconscious. Eventually, when I wake up, I'm in a cell with Quicksilver, Beast, Havoc, Mystique, and Moira McTaggart. I guess I needed that rest since I'm feeling a little better now, and may be able to move fast again. Stryker comes out to ask us where Professor X is, and I laugh, telling him he got abducted by the most powerful mutant in the world, so I doubt he's gonna find him. The others all look at me and wonder how I know that. Stryker asks who I am, and I say that I'm just a tourist, and he should probably get out of here before he gets cut up or anything. Stryker growls and backs off, as Beast asks me who I am and how I know what happened to the Professor. I ask Beast if he remembers Logan, and that I'm sorta like him. Beast is surprised and asks if I've come from the future. I reveal that, yeah, kinda. I'm from the year 2015, and I accidentally ran so fast that I came all the way back here. Marga is pretty shocked to hear that I'm from the future, but Quicksilver and Mystique also remember Logan, so I know it's not out of the realm of possibility. I tell them that the guy who took the professor is named Apocalypse, and he needs to be stopped or else the whole world is doomed. I need to get to the professor myself, as with this help, maybe I can find a way back to the MCU universe, and maybe even further back, so I can save... So I can save everyone. Quicksilver is pretty happy to hear that there's somebody like me who can run so fast I can just zoom back in time, and that would be awesome to race somebody like that. I tell him maybe as soon as we get rid of Apocalypse and get out of here, then we can race. We begin to hear the professor's voice in our head, and I know this is just Apocalypse forcing him to get the world to fear him, but with me here, hopefully we can get rid of him a lot earlier and get all of the mutants on our side. After the message, Havoc says that they made a big mistake taking him here, and he blasts open a door to get us out. 
Right as the doors open, the alarms begin to go off, though they're not for us. The intercom begins to shout out that Weapon X is loose, and that's a pretty good thing to hear, as maybe I can help us have an easier time by recruiting this Weapon X. I tell the others to go down the hall to find a jet, and tell Quicksilver to take Beast and follow me. The two of us zoom off and Beast almost falls over after being dragged like that again, but regains his footing as he sees who's standing in front of us, and he asks, Logan? Wolverine turns to look at him, and is confused at seeing this weird monster in front of him, but for some reason, it looks really familiar. Quicksilver recognizes him too, and tells him that it's good to see him again. Logan asks how these two know him, and Beast looks to me all confused. I tell him that his consciousness was in his younger body, remember? So, he doesn't remember saving the future with all of them all that time ago. I tell Logan that he may not know me, but we know who he really is, and that we can help him get better after the whole procedure he just went through. He just needs to come with us, and he'll be safe. Logan is pretty alone and confused right now over the whole adamantium being put inside of him thing, so he decides to just come along and get the answers with us. Once back at the jet, we all recoup and decide to suit up and figure out what to do next. I apologize to Logan that he did just get freed, but we're gonna need to fight a god right now, and after we're done there, then we can get him some help. Poor guy is used to fighting all these wars and says he'll join up, but we better help him out afterwards. On the way, the others are pretty scared of the upcoming battle after I described that it would be a god, but I tell them that in the future, they all become great heroes, so not to fear. In the future, I'm an Avenger, and I've been in my fair share of battles that are actually not too different from this one, and these guys have fought a force a lot worse than this in the future, and lived to tell it there, so they're gonna live to tell it now, especially with my help. Once we land, it's time to go and stop Apocalypse. First, we're really gonna need some help early, so I need to go Quicksilver and Mystique to try and get an ally. We all run up to where Magneto is, and while trying to convince him, I tell Quicksilver that he has just lost his family. His wife and daughter were killed, so this is why he's with Apocalypse. If he knows that he's his son, it will help him greatly and get him on our side. Quicksilver knows I haven't steered him wrong yet, and he decides to reveal to Magneto that he is his son. Magneto instantly stops flowing the metal around, and the field around us dissipates. He turns to Quicksilver and says he's lying. Quicksilver says he's not, and tells Magneto his mother's name and if he remembers her. Magneto does remember, and can't believe it. He has a son. He floats down to Quicksilver and looks at him. He remembers him from his prison break, and that he said his mom used to know a guy who could control metal. Why didn't he put two and two together then? Since Magneto is so emotional right now, he hugs him to his surprise. Quicksilver hugs him back, and I smile, as I'm glad this time Magneto can finally get a happy ending. I slip away to help the others and come across Storm and Archangel attempting to kill Jean, Scott, Havoc, and Beast. Storm summons her lightning and shoots it out at them, and I run in front of it, absorbing it all inside myself. Storm wonders how that's possible, and I transform to shoot it all right back at her. Storm gets blown back as I rush up to her and tell her to stop this. I know that man saved her life, but with us, she has a better chance to be a hero. Be a part of the X-Men, with us, with Mystique. At the mention of Mystique's name, I point over to where she is, and she sees her with Magneto, who is now also on our side. Storm asks me if I can really help her, which I tell her, of course I can, and offer her my hand. Storm takes it, and I tell her to help when she can, since we need to save the Professor. I speed off, and with an airbending slice, I can knock Archangel out of the air, and with him distracted, Cyclops and Havoc can blast out him to bring him down. With him down for good, I look to see Wolverine fighting with Psylocke, and the two are going at it pretty hard. Though of course in the end, I know Wolverine is going to be fine, so we need to get the Professor. Luckily, Nightcrawler managed to find him, and he teleports all of us away from the battlefield. Though, I let them know we can't take off just yet, and we need to take out Apocalypse now. Quicksilver says he'll come with me, and Magneto will join too, as he's not going to let another child of his die. Quicksilver and I rush up to Apocalypse and blow him back, and I tell him to watch his feet as this guy can adapt quickly and may stop us from getting near him. We each run around and try to strike blows on him, and once I see him trying to trap our feet, I blast it off with my electricity and rush back in. Magneto then throws a metal beam right through Apocalypse's chest to stun him in place when he's not expecting it, and Storm and I blast at him with our lightning to hold him in place. Apocalypse yells out as he tries to blow us away with his power. With his force, we all get blown back, but Wolverine comes up from behind and sticks his claws right through his neck. 
Apocalypse spurts blood, with Cyclops and Havoc firing at him to keep him in place. Once Jean has helped the Professor break free of the connection, she shows up as well to access her connection to the Phoenix Force, and uses its power to completely disintegrate Apocalypse, and ending the threat. All of us collapse to the ground exhausted, and I just wish it could be that easy for other villains. It's a lot better we don't have to have another speedster chasing after you and ruining everything. Hey everybody, sorry to interrupt the video, but it's sponsorship time. This video is sponsored by Fandom Ion, who sells some really great anime and manga merch, and a bunch of other cool merch with some pretty cool prices, such as Marvel merch as well for all you Marvel nerds like me. If you want to get these fine items for an even lower price, then make sure you click the link in the description down below and put in the discount code DAMON for not 5% off, but 10% off of your order. Again, that's code DAMON for 10% off of your order. Hopefully, you won't regret your purchases. Now, let's get back into the video. With Apocalypse defeated and Professor X saved, we all return to the Xavier Mansion, with Jean and Magneto helping to put it back together. With everything situated, it's finally time for me to meet with the Professor. Professor X says it's a pleasure to meet me, and he's happy that I helped motivate the new X-Men team to rise up. I tell him it's no problem, and that I really need his help in getting back to my home, and that once he fully reads my mind, to try and not freak out. Professor X is kinda weirded out by me saying that, and puts his fingers on my head to see what's in there. After a few minutes of searching through, he screams out and backs away from me, sweating and looking very sick. He asks me how this is possible that they're all fictional comic book and movie characters where I come from, how they are played by real actors, how I know of their entire future, how I'm from technical two different universes. It's unreal. How can this be? I apologize for making him go through all that, but that in this reality, everything is real. They may be fictional where I come from, but right now, they're in a reality that's in a vast multiverse out there. They really are real. Professor X needs a minute to cool his head, and after throwing up in his trash can, he begins to gain his senses. And while this is a lot to take in, he now has a clear visual picture of their future, and that even though it's a movie where I am, it's so odd how all of this is happening. I explain that, yeah, I normally don't tell anybody since they would never believe me and would hate the idea. Heck, maybe all of reality is a movie to everybody. Somebody could very well be watching everything we're saying and doing right now. The Professor agrees and says that he's deeply sorry for what I've had to go through in my time in both dimensions. He says that after scanning my memory, I seem to have pushed past my own limits and transcended multiverses. He doubts I'll be able to generate that kind of speed again if I'm alone. If I really need to get back to the previous universe, I need to run as fast as I can with Quicksilver, as he's the only other person who can match my speed and get me home. That makes a lot of sense, and I just ask him if he thinks I'll be able to go back and change what happened. He thinks for a moment, and says that if what he saw in my mind is true, their own future changed drastically from what was supposed to happen. So, he has no doubts that we'll be able to do the same. I stick around for a while longer and watch as a new X-Men team has been officially formed, with the new X-Men being Mystique, Beast, Havoc, Quicksilver, Cyclops, Jean, Nightcrawler, and Wolverine with them being overlooked by both Professor X and Magneto. Magneto isn't going to go off on his own this time, as he doesn't want to leave his son, and even though he has extreme hate for humans, he hopes that this new X-Men team will be able to bring the mutant hate down into the world, and he can be free. Once they are all formed, their first mission is basically Operation Get Damon Home. I asked Quicksilver if he's ready for this, as we need to make sure we give it our all in breaking the multiversal barrier. He says he's got this, he made sure to have a big breakfast. I turn to the rest of the X-Men and thank them for helping me here, and I hope to see them again someday. Quicksilver and I run off as fast as we can, pushing ourselves to the limit. We run around the world countless times trying to generate enough energy to get me back. Nothing is happening yet though, which is worrying me greatly. Will I ever be able to make it back? Is everyone gonna stay dead? Is Karis going to stay dead? No, I won't let that happen. I let the anger flood back through me, and the professor gets into my head saying he's going to help as well. He unlocks all of the rage to the forefront, and I scream out running faster and faster. Quicksilver and I begin to see a portal forming in front of us, and I burst through it into the multiverse. I run through countless realities searching for the one I came from, and I look above me to see the Watcher, the Watcher who brought me here in the first place. He extends out his hand and has the correct universe open in front of me. I barrel through and crash into the ground. I groan at the impact and weakly stand up. 
hearing moaning and groaning from behind me too. I turn quickly to see that Quicksilver is still behind me. I ask him what he's doing here, as he was supposed to stop once the portal opened so he could stay in his universe. He says, it's not as easy as it sounds when you're running faster than you ever have in your life. He wanted to stop, but he was already through the portal, so I figured that if he stopped, he'd be lost in the multiverse. It would be better to stick with me and try and find an easier way home. I help him up and say, I am happy he's here though, as I could use a good 2 on 2 fight to even the odds. Quicksilver's eyes then widen and he tells me to move. He zooms over and punches Rush Hour straight to the ground. Rush Hour didn't expect that and backs up laughing. I glare at him with rage I've never felt before in my life. He looks at me and says, it's cute that I ran away and got back up. He honestly expected me to run back in time, which he was really worried about, but no, I was gone for just two seconds to get another speedster. Doubt that'll bring back my girlfriend. I stop. No, the Watcher brought me back to the moment I left. I failed to go back in time to save everybody. Ultron and the other Ultron bots show up too, informed of where I landed. Quicksilver looks around in worry and asks what we should do now. I look down and give him a straight answer. We're gonna die. No, not yet. With Quicksilver here, I may actually have a fighting chance. It may be a long shot, but I think I have another plan how to bring everybody back. I tell Quicksilver to get ready, and we both rush at Rush Hour and Ultron. Rush Hour and I clash together, sending a huge shockwave through the ruined city. The two of us run around hitting each other away, while countless Ultron bots shoot at me from behind him. Quicksilver is running around trying to get rid of the bots, though Ultron himself is on his tail attempting to take care of him. Luckily, this Quicksilver is much faster than his MCU counterpart, so Ultron is having a tough time being able to catch up to him. I can't let this be the end for us. I need to get away from here and enact my plan. Rush Hour isn't going to let me get away again, and even if I do, I know that he'll just kill Quicksilver. I can't let that happen. I may have been able to recover from the last battle, but I'm still not mentally healed enough to defeat him. I scream at him that he wanted so hard to be a hero, but here he is destroying the planet he wanted to protect. He snarls, saying that humanity is what's ruining this planet. Ultron has the right idea to wipe everybody away, as his plan can truly save the planet. I tell him that doesn't sound like being a better hero than I ever was, as I sure as hell wouldn't destroy humanity trying to prove myself as a hero. He screams at me to shut up, and he uppercuts me away. As I'm disoriented, I get shot in the arm by an Ultron bot, and yell out. Quicksilver then goes to take the bot out, and is bombarded by hundreds more. I see the fear in his eyes as he tries his hardest to take them all out. He can't run forever though. Rush Hour comes up to me, his hand shaking. He says he never wanted it to come to this, but I left him no choice. If only I accepted him, then none of this ever would have happened. I tell him he's the one who beat the crap out of me when I told him he wasn't doing the right thing, so don't be trying to blame me for all of his problems. He beats on me while I'm down, and at the speed he's striking, it feels like I'm getting hit with a thousand trucks. Quicksilver barrels into him to get him off of me, and is then shot in the leg by Ultron and goes down. Both of us are out, but the army surrounding us. Damn it! I'm sorry everyone, I couldn't save us. This is when the earth begins to shake all around us, and lightning is shot up from the ground. Hundreds of Ultron bots are destroyed at once, and Rush Hour asks how I'm doing this. This isn't me though, and suddenly a large burst of lightning erupts from nearby, with Thor erupting out, transformed into his own electric state. I yell out yes as Thor summons Mjolnir and blasts away Ultron and Rush Hour with a mighty blast of lightning. Rush Hour and Ultron are sent flying, and once they come to, try their hardest to battle Thor as the Ultron bots really don't stand a chance. This is exactly the distraction I needed, and since my healing factor is accelerated, I am able to walk soon, and I pick up Quicksilver and run back to my apartment. Quicksilver asks what we're doing here, and I reach into my dresser to take out the Tesseract. He asks what it is, and I explain it is one of the Infinity Stones, allowing us to travel wherever we want in the galaxy. I have a plan to bring back all those who have died, though I need a magician to do it. Not on Earth will do it for us, but I know that one out in space definitely will, or at least I hope he will. I tell Quicksilver to stay here as I need to go and get the next object. 
I run out and as fast as I can make my way to Kamertage and infiltrate the Sanctum to steal the Time Stone. It took a while to track down, but thankfully with my speed, none of the wizards guarding it are able to pinpoint where I am. I steal the Eye of Agamotto and head back to my apartment where I let Quicksilver know that I just snatched up another Infinity Stone. With this one, we'll be able to bring everybody back. I don't have the power myself to use it since I'm not a magician. There is one I know of though, who I'm pretty sure I can convince to help us. I use the technology I stole from S.H.I.E.L.D. to activate the Tesseract, and with its power, I open a portal to a prison cell on Asgard where I run inside and take out Loki. Loki yells out wondering where the hell he is and why I'm here. I explain to him that I just broke him out of prison and I'll make sure he doesn't get put back there if he agrees to help me. Loki says he's not helping the man who put him there in the first place and summons the knife to attack me. I dodge of course and unleash my own version of the Thundershock surprise to trap Loki. He yells out as he can't move and I explain that I've gotten a lot more powerful since we last fought and I could send him back there the rot or even tell Odin that he broke out and have him executed. I won't do any of those things unless he helps me now. I send in more power to the thunder and Loki yells out that he'll help me. I stop the attack and show Loki the eye of Agamotto. And if he knows what it is, he says that it is the time stone and asks how I got my hands on it. Not important right now though, and I ask him if he has the power to use it, as he is a great magician. He says he has no idea as he's a trickster god, not a wizard, but he can try his hardest. Loki puts the eye around his neck and uses his powers to try and activate it. After a couple of attempts, thankfully it opens, and Loki now has access to the stone. I tell him to try it on Quicksilver's leg, which Quicksilver is opposed to, but once Loki uses it, the hole in his leg is all healed up. This might actually work. I praise Loki for the work and tell the two of them that this is the moment of truth, and ask if they're ready. Thor has been doing his best to hold off Rush Hour and Ultron. The bots in and of themselves are easy, no issues there. Though, the Rush Hour mortal is a quick little bastard and not easy to hit. Ultron can phase through his attacks and try to strike back with his own, but with Thor's electricity, he can short out the phasing just enough so Ultron can't phase through him. He is just as strong as Thor though, and the two of them clash and deal with the other. Thor is very powerful right now with his form he got in Ragnarok and having Mjolnir with him as well. He's able to distract the two long enough for them to realize that me and Quicksilver are gone. Rush Hour is infuriated and runs away from the fight to go and track me down yet again. He tries to think of places that I could run away to, and runs around all over New York and eventually finds my apartment. Though, I'm not there. He runs around everywhere he can think of, but nothing. He returns to the battlefield to try and find me there, and is nailed by a blur coming right at him. He stands up saying, you've been a real pain in my su- wait, what? Pietro stands in front of Rush Hour with a look that could kill. Rush Hour is too stunned to speak. But he killed him? How is this possible? A red glow then forms around him as he is lifted into the air by Wanda. Her too! She's supposed to be dead! This can't be happening! Wanda throws Noman away, directly into Iron Man, who blasts him back towards the ground. Him too! There's no way! He is then hit in the neck with an electric tonfa by Black Widow, stunning him. He goes to strike until he is hit in the face by Captain America's shield, and Hawkeye shoots two arrows directly into his legs. Noman screams out, falling to the ground, until Hulk picks him up and hurls him into a nearby building. Rush Hour lays there, bleeding and broken, but finds the energy to try and get up, until a purple energy flows around him this time, and every bone in his body shatters. Karis walks up to Noman to reveal herself, telling him that was for Mobius and Sylvie. The Avengers come up to him and glare, as I run up, smiling. He weakly asks me how I was able to do this, as I lean down and tell him, guess I'm the better hero after all, and shoot out lightning directly at him. Rush Hour screams as I sap away all of his speed and add it to my own. I explode in energy, gaining newfound speeds. Rush Hour is no longer a threat. Ultron and his robots appear looking terrified, wondering how can this be? Thor looks to see Loki on our side and smiles. He guesses his brother wasn't so bad after all. Ultron yells out that this doesn't make a difference. More Ultron bots are being created by the hundreds. It'll be the same outcome as last time. Ultron then has the purple energy surrounding him as well, and he's slammed to the ground hard. Karis pulls him back up, enjoying every second of this. I hold out the tempide eyed Loki used a time stone on as well, saying this time, we're not alone. 
a massive time door opens behind us with the X-Men stepping out ready for battle. Quicksilver smiles as he sees his team come out to help, and the Avengers and X-Men join together and rush Ultron and his bots. This battle is massive, one that words can't really describe. I'll try though. The two teams working together are able to easily best most of the Ultron bots, with Thor and Storm shooting out lightning to obliterate the robots, Beast and Hulk tearing them to shreds, Iron Man and Cyclops blasting them into nothingness, and Captain America and Wolverine shred them all, with Wolverine deflecting Cap's shield right back at him with his claws. Cap thinks that's pretty awesome. Jean and Wanda use their telekinesis to crush the bots one by one and send them directly into each other. Both are impressed by the other's immense power, yet sense something darker within the other. Both Quicksilvers run together thrashing bots, with Pietro kinda jealous how Peter is so much faster than him. Karis and I work together once more to take down all of the bots, and damn, am I so happy to be fighting alongside her again. Yet, even with the Avengers and X-Men working together like this, there are too many bots and it seems like they're not gonna stop coming. That is until all of them stop in place and are risen to the air. Thousands fly up as Magneto rises them all into the air to stop them from getting away. He tells the others to blast at it now, and everybody who can shoot some kind of blast, all fire the most that they can, and the bots are all destroyed. The last one remaining is Ultron himself. The others tried to kill him first, but even though this is the one who killed Karis, I know that we can't let him die. Magneto, Karis, Wanda, and Jean work together to keep him in place as I run up and stab the USB arrow right into his eye to download the Jarvis data inside of him. Inside the Vision body, Ultron and Jarvis both fight for control, but with Jarvis prepared this time, he is able to corrupt Ultron's sentience with his own and erase his programming from existence. Jarvis takes over the body, becoming the one true Vision. Ultron is no more. Everybody cheers in victory. Sweet victory, we did it. After the fight, the Avengers and X-Men all go around working together to make sure that the civilians are all safe. And they make sure to get to know each other a little bit better too. I made sure to take the Time Stone from Loki after he used it on everybody's bodies to bring them back. And I thank him for his help in saving the world. He says that's no problem at all, as he was able to get this out of it. He holds up the Tesseract revealing that he stole it from me, and uses its portal to send him off to parts unknown. Of course he'd still double cross, as it's Loki after all. I just don't have the energy to go after him right now. We'll save that for another day. Once everybody is able to stand again and the civilians are able to come back out, we used a temp pad to open a portal back to the X-Men universe. I thank Professor X for agreeing to come to help us, and he says that I helped save their universe, so they had to come and save mine. It was only fair. I make sure to give Peter a hug and thank him for all of his help, and really, being a huge inspiration on my life in general. He doesn't understand what that last part meant, but says he's always happy to go out and save two universes from an evil robot anytime. And hey, if I'm ever able to run to another universe again, to feel free to say hello. The X-Men all walk through the time door back into their home reality. Eventually, once the whole city is set, the Avengers are all set to leave, with damage control and other departments coming in to clean up the wreckage. S.H.I.E.L.D. also makes sure to take a depowered Noman Deeps and transfer him to the newly completed Raft, where he may spend the rest of his days. Wanda and Pietro stand around wondering what they should do now, and I come up to them and tell them they should come with us. Pietro wonders how I can still look at him after everything that they put us through. I tell him that it really wasn't his fault. They were both corrupted by Rush Hour, and while Pietro did do more bad than Wanda, I know that they have the potential to become fantastic people and great heroes. I think that when Pietro sacrificed himself to save Hawkeye in the original timeline, even though he knew he was going to die then, he was selfless and saved life. So, I know that there is good inside of him. With us, they can redeem themselves and help out as Avengers, and maybe Pietro can become as fast as the other Quicksilver. Quicksilver. Pietro thinks that's not a bad name, and they both agree to come along with us. For Vision, we know he's fine, though when we take him back with us, we need to make sure that we hide him so people don't think Ultron is still alive. He can't hide forever though, so he may need to be redesigned so people don't think of Ultron when they see him. Once the Avengers return to the tower, and I sneak back to Kamratash to return to Time Stone, I explain to them what happened and how I brought them all back. The Avengers are obviously still shaken over having literally died, but are very thankful that at least Thor and I survived to bring them all back. 
Of course, the Avengers aren't exactly the most loved in the world right now after what happened, but I'm just too tired to deal with the press right now, and once Karis and I return to our apartment, I pass out and stay passed out for a long time. I'm passed out for so long that the events of Ant-Man pretty much play out. The Avengers really don't go out to help with that, as the press and more importantly the government aren't really happy with all the destruction caused by our incompetence. Unfortunately, as hard as I tried to prevent something like this from happening, we may have a civil war in our hands. What happens there though? Well, you're just gonna have to wait until we begin Phase 3 for that. This part wraps up the events of Phase 2 of What If Damon Was In The MCU, and I gotta say, thank you all so much for the support on this phase, as your guys' comments really meant a lot, as this got a lot more support than I expected. Even though this may have felt like a finale, we still have a lot more to cover when we head into Phase 3 of this scenario. For right now though, I'm gonna take a little break to come up with some new ideas, so make sure to leave some down below on what you think should happen next. Thank you all so much for watching this episode, and I hope to see you for the next one. Until we meet again guys, see you later!